Okie dokie, let's do this. How's the transmission? Can everybody see me? Can everybody hear me? Excellent. Thank you for confirming. Uh, welcome to another MySound webinar. Today we're going to talk about Lena, Lena in Houses of Worship. Uh, but before doing so, as always, we're going to start with a uh, with a few household notes first. So without further ado, I'm going to share my screen and uh, let's look at those household notes first. We're using the Zoom uh, communication platform to conduct these webinars. And that means that in front of you, you are expected to have a window, not unlike the one you see over here. And um, if you want to see who else is joining you during today's session, uh, there's a very convenient way to do so, uh, which is by clicking on the participants button. If you click on the participant button, uh, a window pops up on the right hand side showing the fellow attendees in today's uh, webinar. Um, we encourage you to make use of the chat function uh, to ask questions, uh, but before you pose your question, please raise your hand. There is a gray button living at the bottom of that window. If you click that gray button, a blue hand icon pops up in the corner of my eye, uh, informing me that you're about to ask a question. Now, to ask that actual question, we encourage you to make use of the chat function. So there's a chat balloon icon over here. Please click on that icon, which will split the right pane in half, uh, bringing up a chat dialogue. And at the bottom of that dialogue, there's a field where you can enter a message. Uh, you can address the nation, which is to say everybody that is joining us today on the call. Or if you happen to see a family member, colleague, or a friend, you can also select that person in private and uh, address the me message uh, to that person. Uh, that pretty much uh, concludes the household notes. Um, for those that are joining us on Facebook, uh, welcome. Uh, our user community group is um, currently where we're live streaming and it has over 8,750 members and growing. Welcome to you as well. And um, this is going to be another chapter uh, where we demonstrate the precision tool set. Uh, today we're going to uh, work a lot in MAP uh, at the end of today's uh, webinar, which is one of those pillars of the tool set, our turnkey solution for designing systems, deploying systems, managing systems, um, everything that you need for a successful uh, production. Um, today it's all about House of Worships and Lena is the star of the, sto uh, the, char the, star of the show. Um, we're going to work in MAP by the end of the webinar, as I already said, and that means that there have been several uh, webinars on MAP XT uh, up until now, and uh, all of those, you know, uh, are available for you to watch on YouTube. Uh, many of the things that we'll do today uh, somewhat assume that you are familiar with what we discussed in those previous webinars. Uh, so uh, you can always go back to the YouTube channel, Thinking Sound, where you can revisit those uh, previous webinars and uh, and look at the um, at the things that we discussed during those webinars. Um, by the end of today's uh, webinar, uh, I want to take a stab at designing a system for a fan-shaped uh, room. Many houses of worships, uh, not to be mistaken for churches and cathedrals, but houses of worship, many of them uh, can be fan-shaped, which uh, makes for an interesting challenge. So today we're going to finish by looking at a practical example of how to design um, a Lina array, um, a main PA system uh, for such a venue and, um, and the challenges and the choices that we face in such an approach. But we'll save that for later. Um, of course, today we're going to talk a little bit about rigging because after all, we're going to show Lina. And um, whenever we discuss rigging, we have this uh, this brief disclaimer. So all Meyer Sound products and accessories must be used in accordance with local, state, federal, and industry regulations. It's the owner's and or user's responsibility to evaluate reliability of any rigging method for the application. Rigging should always be carried out only by experienced professionals. Inspect rigging hardware regularly and also before each usage. Always use certified and properly rated rigging hardware and ensure not to exceed the rated loading weight documented in the operating instructions and or assembly guides and always use safety cable or safety steel as secondary support uh, that goes without saying uh, speaks for itself and that means that um, let's get to today's star of the show um, lena is the loudspeaker that we'll be using uh, today it's the smallest uh, it's the smallest family member of the um, of the leo family and interestingly enough everything that we learned during the development of Leo, uh, Lion, and Leopard, everything that we learned during that development uh, ultimately ended up in Lena. Lena is the um, successor of uh, Mina, 
So, so let's look at what, um, what Lena is. Um, so there we go. Uh, Lena features a, a three inch diaphragm HF compression driver and two six and a half inch long excursion cone drivers. Uh, each of those transducers is, uh, uh, is powered by uh, a class D amplifier channel, which also uh, features built-in DSP. It's a concentric design, as you see. So the, 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 REM, the, the REM manifold, the ribbon annulation manifold um, mounted to the compression driver lives between the uh, six and a half inch um, cone drivers. And then we see the, the, the rear panel of the Lena enclosure, which has your um, audio inputs as well as RMS. And um, unlike Mina, little fact, uh, there is not a single vent in uh, a Lena enclosure. Uh, unlike Mina, there is two vents, which also double as uh, hand grips, as handlebars. So that is uh, very convenient. So there you have your, your Lena. There you have your first um, introduction. So let's look a little bit more in depth. Lena and Mina is functionally the same loudspeaker enclosure. That is to say, it's the same physical enclosure, but uh, goes without saying that Lena is a superior loudspeaker in every uh, regard. That being said, if we look at the dimensions, uh, obtained from both data sheets, then these loudspeakers are physically, functionally the same size to a millimeter, which also means that if you insist, you can uh, deploy them, you can mix Mina and Lena within a single array. Uh, we'll save that for another day, but uh, we've provided for that with help of delay integration and product integration, you can make that work. That being said, it is a loudspeaker that has exactly the same dimensions as its predecessor as uh, Mina. So here we see that the width is the same and the height of the enclosure is the same and the depth of the enclosure is the same and the weight has functionally remained the same within half a kilogram or so. That being said, Lina on average is about two decibels more powerful than Mina. Um, interesting fact, um, Mina comes from a time where we would rate peak output using music as the source because we don't go to pink noise concerts. Uh, we attend concerts or we watch movies where uh, typically music is being played as the source and uh, on average anywhere from two hours or more. So there was a time where we would rate loudspeaker performance uh, using music at the source. Today we feel that we have a superior solution which is M noise, which stands for music noise. Um, and it's dense where all notes are played at the same time. So we stopped using music and we augmented uh, existing test signals such as pink noise and B noise. We augmented those with M noise, which has now become the replacement for determining maximum linear peak SPL uh, for a signal that has similar characteristics as music. Now we're gonna do a webinar in the future on M noise. That being said, those that are interested now are encouraged after the webinar to visit mnoise.org and read more about what makes mnoise so special and uh, why the AES has an interest in adopting this as a standard as we speak. But that's a different story altogether. Back to Lena. Um, there are several things that set Lena apart from Mina. Um, some of them uh, very obvious, some of them a little more obscure. The continuous lines in this frequency response um, show you in the top the magnitude response of Lina, and in the bottom it shows you the phase response of Lina. Whereas the dashed line in the top shows you the magnitude response of Mina, and in the bottom shows you the phase response of Mina. And uh, notice that um, as far as the magnitude response is concerned, that Mina has a flat, has a flat magnitude response. Uh, which is always a little bit ambiguous because depending on who you ask, uh, flat is a matter of opinion. Some people think that this is flat. Other people agree that this is also flat because it is a continuous single slope. And there might be people that, can, people that can, uh, agree that this is also flat because it's a continuous uh, single slope. That's why rather than talking about flat, uh, we prefer to say equal amplitude which is saying that if I apply one volt at 100 hertz, that I get the same amount of SPL as when I apply one volt at one kilohertz or when I apply one volt at 10 kilohertz. In all those instances, when I apply the same amount of voltage, I get the same amount of am uh, amplitude, I get the same amount of SPL. And that makes equal amplitude uh, less subject to uh, a, a matter of taste or opinion other than uh, flat. So, 
Flat is the colloquial term, but I prefer to say equal amplitude, and Mina used to have a flat response. Whereas Lina has what we call a native response, and the native response shows that unlike Mina, that in the native response, we see that high, mid and high frequencies have been emphasized um, rather than keeping it flat for a perfectly good reason that we're about to uh, discover. Uh, the other thing that you might notice is that overall, the phase response of Lina, uh, like um, other recent products uh, such as Leopard, Ultra X40s, Ultra X20s, they all belong to a phase curve family which is known as PC5570, which means that the wraparound lives between 55 and 70 hertz. And below that frequency, below that threshold, if you will, the phase response is functionally flat. This also is the case for MENA, except that with MENA, that wraparound doesn't live between 55 and 70 hertz, it lives at 630 hertz, so we call that phase curve, we call that PC630. So not only has the uh, magnitude response changed in Lina for good reasons, but it's also the phase response, which has vastly improved and now features a wraparound, which is much lower in frequency, therefore much better impulse uh, response, much better transients, much more impulse true, if you will. Uh, does that mean that I cannot use Mina and Lina together? Sure, you can. Just make sure that you make use of delay integration, which is now part of product integration. If you're interested in that, we dedicated an entire webinar on product integration, which you can find on our YouTube channel. Now, let's look a little bit at what could explain that difference between the new native response and the old flat response that used to be or belongs uh, to MENA. Well, all things being equal, Imagine that we have an array, an array that consists of several uh, Lina and Mina elements, everything the same, same splay angles, same number of enclosures, all things being equal. And we have uh, an array of Mina loudspeakers and we have an array of Lina loudspeakers. If we measure at uh, about 10 meters distance, which is about three array lengths, that's a respectable uh, distance for a system uh, of this uh, for form factor. If we look at the response of um, our MENA array, which where a single enclosure has a flat response, then we see a substantial buildup of uh, low and mid frequencies until it levels out once more. This is perfectly normal line array behavior uh, because every line array element is functionally omnidirectional at low frequencies. And that meter means that wherever you go, you and I in a room listening to an array, wherever we go, we're in the joint custody of all those low frequency sections, all those low frequency transducers. And provided they're coupled, they will add. So what we see that buildup at low frequencies is a function which is perfectly normal behavior. Um, we, um, provided you with the means to uh, attenuate those frequencies, uh, which we'll see uh, in a little bit. But it's interesting, worth pointing out, that uh, a Lina array, same number of loudspeakers, uh, same inter-element display angles, all things being equal, that the Lina has a much more, let's say for lack of description, a much better behaved response when we fire up the entire array, which is, um, which is worth um, looking into. Um, so what is, what is going on here? Well, we see the coupling at low frequencies, which causes that buildup in low frequencies. Um, but how would we address this in the, uh, how would we address this in the past? Um, when Galileo was still our flagship, uh, loudspeaker management system, uh, uh, or DSP, there used to be a top, which was called array correction. And array correction basically at the loudspeaker management system level would allow you to choose your M series uh, product. Uh, today it happens to be MENA. And then you would have to choose the number of elements that you're using, the length of the array, and on which physical outputs that array lived. And what it ended up doing is attenuate those mid and low frequencies in anticipation of the buildup due to the mutual coupling between adjacent loudspeakers. And then in the end, you would have the same result as you have with Lina today, but it would also require the user 
to perform an extra step at the loudspeaker management system. So uh, Mina in Compass 3, using Galileo at the time, when using array correction, M-series array correction, would end up looking like Lina does today with help of an extra step. So what has changed? What has essentially changed through the decades? What has changed is that rather than applying the attenuation of the coupling due to the um, interaction with the, an array, rather than, uh, rather than applying that correction at the loudspeaker management system upstream, it has been relocated and um, built into the inherent response of a single element. Uh, notice that these shapes are in good agreement, and we refer to that as the native response. And that means that once you deploy uh, that linear array, then the, the user is relieved of having to take uh, extra steps, and the array already puts you really quickly in a place where you feel comfortable yielding excellent system performance with minimal external processing, uh, unlike before. And that approach is what we refer to uh, as native, so you deploy the system as advertised, and then you're already in a place where you really, really, really feel comfortable. Um, so that is native, and that's where Lina differs uh, from Mina. Okay, the companion subwoofer, or low frequency control element, as we like to say, the companion subwoofer that goes with Lina is the 750LFC. And the 750LFC uh, consists of a, a single 15 inch dual coil, that's two coils, long excursion uh, direct radiator. Its operating uh, range is from 35 hertz to 125 hertz. And uh, for both coils is uh, used a two channel class D amplifier um, module. And that subwoofer, as we're about to discover, can be flown in line with the Lina array elements. So Lina is very versatile, very compact, and comes with lots of rigging options. Of course, I can fly a Lina array just like I could do with a Mina array. In fact, you use the same top grid because the Mina enclosure is, is functionally down to a millimeter is the same enclosure as a Lina enclosure. So we can use the same rigging hardware and I can fly a Lina array using the uh, Lina array top grid. Um, I could do it without subwoofers, but if I want, I can do so also with the 750 LFC low frequency control element in a single line. That being said, um, we can also ground stack Lina using that same top grid, but except that the top grid no longer lives in the top, but in the bottom of the array. Um, and then we can ground stack those Lina elements as well. Um, of course, those Lina elements could also be elevated in height and live on top of the 750 LFCs. That is all uh, perfectly uh, doable. And there is even the option to mount a few Lina loudspeakers with help of a U uh, with a yoke um, uh, on top of a speaker pole living in a speaker pole receptacle of the 750 LFC or a loudspeaker stand. We can do this with the yoke and there is also the option to use that same yoke to suspend those Lina elements in this example from a piece of truss. Besides the yoke, there is also the option to use a bracket, and that bracket allows us to uh, place the Lina elements, again, uh, with help of a speaker pole on top of a superwoofer or a separate stand. And needless to say, that bracket can also be used to mount the Lina elements uh, either to a truss or even suspend them to a uh, ceiling. And finally, as you would come to expect from us, the Lina comes with a caster frame, very convenient, and a cover uh, to transport the elements from A to B. Um, I would like to um, show you that a little bit more in action. So I motion that we, um, I motion that we um, go to the next video, but there's a question which says, so with a single cabinet or multiple cabinets, do you get native response without any processing? Yes, the native response that I showed before is baked in, if you will. It is a property of the loudspeaker enclosure, regardless of what processing goes on upstream in your Galaxy or Callisto or Galileo uh, loudspeaker management system. So it relieves the user of having to perform extra steps and gets you in a place where you feel really comfortable without having to do any extra uh, or a minimum amount of external processing. Okay, back to the rigging. So uh, let's see that in action by looking at the following animation. So here we have our caster frame. 
It comes with quick lock pins, quick release pins, um, and that means that um, we can take out those pins and um, we can attach our 750 LFC to the caster frame. And we keep doing so by adding another um, um, 750 using our uh, guide links. Uh, there comes the first Lina element, speaks for itself. Uh, you can set a splay up to 11 degrees, a very convenient, very quick um, way to deploy this very small, uh, this ultra compact uh, line array or curvilinear system. Um, so that concludes Lina. That's the star of today's show. If you want to know more about the rigging, please uh, consult the um, operational instructions and rigging hardware guide, which you can find on the Meyer Sound website. Excellent. So, if you want to know more about Lina, we encourage you to visit our website because Production Partner Magazine in Germany wrote a, a super cool article about Lina and the 750 LFC. And as you know from Production Partner Magazine, they will show you the inside of the loudspeaker. They will show you the raw response of the transducers. They will show you the response of the controller card. Uh, and that is uh, something that a lot of you will be interested in. So be sure to read the Production Partner article, which you can find on our website. It shows you, it's almost intimate, if you will, a very intimate uh, encounter with Lina and her insights, so to speak. Um, be sure to watch that, um, very interesting. A lot of measurements for you to look at, including distortion measurements and more. Okay, so um, let's look at a handful of examples where Lena has been used in uh, houses of worship. Here we see the Word of Grace Bible Church and um, notice that because of the small four factor, uh, it, is really, uh, it is really not intrusive, as you can see in this case. Uh, what we have over here is um, several Lina uh, curvilinear elements as um, on the house right side. Um, it's being uh, accompanied in this case by 900 LFC because the client purportedly wanted a little bit more um, in the low end. We see a, a UPA outfill, a UPA 1P living on the right side in this photo, and we have a UP Junior uh, living on the inside acting as an infill. Um, here we see another example. This is St. Andrew's Presbyterian Church. Uh, we also offer, this goes for all our products, we offer um, uh, every loudspeaker in custom RHEL colors. So you can uh, specify that you want a specific RHEL color and then the loudspeakers uh, will be spray painted internally as well as uh, externally. Um, and you can get those loudspeakers in any RHEL color of your choosing. Um, here we are looking at uh, Lina's and uh, UPQ outfills, if I'm not mistaken. And also over here, we see the 900 LFC sitting to the left and the right in a cardioid stack. If we um, look up close, then we see that this is, um, again, a very discreet, very non-intrusive, um, a, a whitish color. And um, again, a house of worship example. And then one of my favorite examples of the advantage of having such a powerful but uh, small form factor, which is the Holy Spirit Catholic Church in Las Vegas. Because who sees the loudspeakers? Does anyone see the loudspeakers in this picture? Where does Lena live? Well, this is what you get when you have a very, very well collaboration with architects and integrators. Because the Lena system, including the 750 LFCs, live in the centerpiece. Yes, I'm not kidding. In the centerpiece, there are three Lina arrays of six elements each facing in three of the cardinal directions. So there's one facing toward us, uh, pointing out of the screen, and then at 90 degree angles, there is one firing to the left and there's one firing to the right. Even still leaving room for the skylight where we see daylight enter into the room. And that is another one of my favorite examples of uh, using Lina in a um, house of worship in a way which is completely visually uh, obscured. Very, very cool. Okay, that brings us to our example, the example that I chose for today, which is our fan shape room, um, using Lina um, as the system. So here we see our uh, fan shape room, and um, we'll have a discussion whether uh, we should go for an LCR system. Now, what I, do I mean by an LCR system? For me, uh, there's two kinds of LCR system. There is the LCR system, which is used in musical theater, which we'll discuss another time, 
where you have three discrete channels, left, center, and right, and where the challenge becomes to cover the majority of your audience within joint custody of those three discrete channels. And then there is the other kind of LCR, which is more like a triple mono, if you will, where you have um, three discrete arrays that all reproduce the same program content. And in the fan-shaped room, uh, depending on the, the angle of the fan, as we're about to discover, that is a, a tried and tested method. And um, we'll, we'll look into whether today we should uh, attempt at doing a, a left-right uh, or a, an LCR. And um, we're going to make an attempt at uh, designing that room in MapXT. I'm going to work in two instances because I want to work in plan view and I want to work at the same time in section view. Uh, now, before we start looking at the design, there's, there's a couple of uh, dilemmas that we need uh, to come to terms with. For example, what would we need to, uh, to, what would we need to cover this room with only left, right? Well, there is a mechanism which is known as forward aspect ratio. And I'm quite confident that if you were to Google that, that you can find more about forward aspect ratio. Long story short, um, the loudspeaker that would be required to cover one half of our space would need to be 120 degrees. But Lena only is 100 degrees, which means that on either side, I'm 20 degrees shy of the ideal candidate. So we're about to discover that if we use Lena uh, each to cover one half of the room, that it's going to be a really, really tight fit and might actually uh, have some underexposed areas by the time that we're done. Um, frankly, between the two of us, if I were to do this and uh, insist on using left, right, then I'd rather prefer to use leopard because leopard is 110 degrees, unlike Lena, which is 100 degrees. But today is all about Lena, so let's see whether Lena can come uh, up with sufficient coverage without leaving any unexposed areas, underexposed areas. However, if we don't go for a, a dual mono approach where each loudspeaker, in this case, is sole custodian over half of the room, then we could also go for the other kind of LCR, not in a musical theater sense, but the LCR where we basically have three main arrays with equal, uh, with equal uh, job descriptions. And in that case, um, the ideal candidate for each array to cover one third of the room would be a loudspeaker whose forward aspect ratio is 1.86. Uh, that becomes about 65 degrees. Now, Lena is, uh, Lena is 35 degrees too wide for that job description. So now we have to look what happens if I'm 20 degrees too narrow versus what happens if I'm 35 degrees too wide. If I have to choose the lesser of two evils, I'd rather have a loudspeaker that is a little bit too white, resulting in a little bit too much overlap between adjacent systems rather than having a system that is a little bit too narrow um, and, that le and, and might leave areas that are underexposed. So these are the two options that um, we have to be mindful of. I'm going to explore both options. That being said, I'm going to give you another argument why stereo in a, in a classic, like in a stereophonic sense, why stereo in a fan-shaped room might be a little bit uh, reaching for something which might be uh, a little bit out of reach. So um, let's um, stop Keynote and let's go over to the uh, plan view. So over here in MapXT, we're working in plan view and uh, what we see here is our uh, seating plane. and um, the first thing that I want to figure out is like what is what is the what is the angle of this fan shape? What is the angle of this particular wedge? And um, that means that I'm going to start drawing on top of this. And uh, notice that over here, I've made a little cross. That cross is the origin of what is basically a very large circle. We're only looking at a slice of pizza of something which is a much larger circle. We're looking at a officially it's known as a sector. We're looking at a sector of a larger circle. And the first thing that I want to know is starting at the origin, what is the angle that I need to cover? Because that gives me a, a rough indication of um, the, um, 
the, the, the challenge that we need to overcome. So if you were to measure this, you would discover that this is a 110 degree angle. And there's actually a very convenient way that we can do that using a visual architectural aid. So let me clear my annotation and let's bring up a visual architectural aid. I'm not going to explain why this works the way it does because we have discussed that during previous webinars. Suffice it to say that I drew a line segment of a given length with a given radius. I'm uh, going to select my line segment. I'm going to use the pivot tool and I'm going to put the pivot point at my radius, at my origin, because now like the dial of a clock, I can uh, pivot this line segment. And if I start at the outer seats over here, then I have a certain angle. And with respect to that angle, which is my absolute angle, which is 35 degrees in the negative, but it also shows you outside the parentheses, it also shows you the angle uh, that I'm about to, to show, the one that I want to figure out. Because from this angle all the way to the other angle, that will appear, and it will be roughly about 110 degrees. It shows negative 110 degrees, but the, the, the number that you should be looking for, the value that you should be looking for, is the value that lives outside the parentheses. So we need 110 degrees of coverage from outer seat house left all the way to outer seat house right. I have no more application for that line segment, so I'm going to uh, delete it. But there you see a very convenient way to look at what is the size of this sector. Now, let's assume for a second that we would want to attempt to cover this with a classic uh, stereophonic approach. In order to show you the, the, the limited um, capabilities in a fan-shaped room, mind you, we're talking about a fan-shaped room, I've uh, prepared um, a left-right system, and I'm going to uh, bring it forward. So I've revealed that layer, and in this layer, we have... Um, two mm temps, which is about our smallest subwoofer uh, that you and I can think of, um, the smallest subwoofer. And at 50 hertz, these guys are essentially uh, omnidirectional. Now imagine that um, this is house left, and over here we have house right. Um, what, is, what is the danger that we're facing? Well, um, I'm gonna do a prediction, and I'm gonna do a prediction at a very specific frequency, and that frequency is going to be uh, 50 hertz. So I want to see one third octave interval centered at 50 hertz. And I want to see a prediction of those two omnidirectional sources, which looks like this. Now, what you see here is perfectly normal. We see uh, power alleys and we see power valleys. Uh, anyone that has played outside with large scale sound systems uh, consisting of left right subwoofers is intimately familiar with this. So in the center, we have what is known as a power alley. It's where you stand on the nose of doom. It's where you have the landslide. It's where you have the earthquake. However, uh, to the left, as Bob McCarthy would say, we see these little blue rivers. And in these little blue rivers, there is silence. There is cancellation. There is destructive interference. We call that a power valley. However, next to my first power valley, there is a secondary power alley, and then comes another power valley, and then comes another power alley. Same is true for the other side of the room. We have a power alley, <laughs> followed up by a power valley, and then another power alley. The cause for this interference problem, the cause for this uh, alternating pattern of power alleys and power valleys are time offsets. Time offsets are the cause here because there is differences in distance between each spectator and either house left or house right. And that translates into time offsets. Now, why did I chose 50 Hertz? I chose 50 Hertz for a very specific reason, because what is the time period if you are 50 Hertz? The time period if you are 50 Hertz is 1000 milliseconds divided by 50 cycles. That's the frequency that we're looking at, 50 cycles. And that gives you 20 milliseconds. That is how long it takes for 50 hertz to finish a single revolution. I'm going to leave that on the screen because um, I want to go to our power 
alleys. So let's go to our power alleys, which is one over here and one over there. Now, many of you are expected to know that in order to have cancellation, you need to have 180 degree phase offset. That's what happens, you know, if we, if we, if we flip the polarity, if we reverse the polarity in a loudspeaker management system, we basically flip the waveform upside down. Everything that was positive became negative and everything that was negative became positive. So in order to have cancellation, we need 180 degree offset, which is the same as one half cycle. So in order to achieve that 180 degree offset or half a cycle, it suffices at 50 Hertz to have a 10 millisecond time offset because 10 milliseconds out of 20 milliseconds for a time period, that is a uh, half a cycle if you're 50 Hertz, which explains why we see these blue rivers, which explains why we see these power valleys. Because if you're living at this point in space, okay, if you're living at this point in space, where we see that blue river at 50 Hertz, it is because you're physically closer to house left. At that point in space, you're physically closer to house left in comparison to house right. If you're physically closer to house left, it is leading. And the only amount of time offset that can cause at 50 Hertz this cancellation if it's leading by half a cycle, which is half of 20 milliseconds, which means at this point in space, house left is leading by 10 milliseconds. And the same is, of course, true for the other side of the room. Over here, we see another power valley because the people that live over there are physically closer to house right than to house left. So on the right side of our central power alley, on the right side where we see that first blue river, uh, it is because the right side of our sound system, house right, is leading by half a cycle. Now, why do I go out of my way of showing you this? Because this gives us a very convenient way to show that part of the audience where house left and house right arrive within 10 milliseconds or less relative arrival time. It also means that everybody that lives in this part of the room is hearing house right leading by as little as 10 milliseconds. And everybody that is living in this part of the room is hearing house left leading by at least 10 milliseconds or more. And what happens if the left or right channel for correlated signals, which is your money channel, which is the most expensive fader on your console, which is typically your lead vocal or your lead instrumentalist, not to mention kick drum and typically electric bass guitar. What happens if left or right in your stereophonic image is leading by 10 milliseconds or more, then the Haas effect kicks in. The Haas effect kicks in, which is a sensory inhibition. It doesn't come with an off switch. And that means that for the vast majority of your audience, the vast majority of your audience, which is basically everyone in this part of the room, left is leading by 10 milliseconds. And for the other half of the room, right is leading by 10 milliseconds, greatly diminishing your window of opportunity for stereophonic, um, stereophonic perception. Only a very, very, very small minority, very small minority, in the middle of your room lives within an interval, lives within an interval where the time offset between left and right is, uh, is less than 10 milliseconds. But that clearly constitutes a minority, a minority of the overall audience. So that is another argument for you to consider uh, why in a fan-shaped room, mind you, in a fan-shaped room, why um, true stereophonic imagery for the majority of your audience might be uh, out of reach. Okay, so that being said, let's start looking at whether we can do this with left, right, or whether we can do this with left, center, right. That is to say, dual mono using only two arrays or triple mono using uh, three arrays. So let's look at the stereo approach first. This would be the solution for stereo. 
that is basically trying to split your room in half and making one array sole custodian over one half of the room and one array sole custodian over the other room. Now you might notice that I've made some triangles in here. If you want to know what those triangles are about, you should definitely watch the down tilt translation webinar, which is where we introduce the triangles. But this triangle that we have over here, as well as the other side, that is showing me the width of the loudspeaker. Now, what do we mean by width? It shows us how far I can go off axis before I lose six decibels of level or more. So this is the width that we're talking about. And as long as I stay within that triangle, my level will not vary by more than six decibels. However, once I leave that area, level drops by more than six decibels. Now notice that my triangles cannot meet each other in the center of the room, which means that in the center of the room, I do not have minus six meeting minus six. If I were to have minus six meeting minus six in the middle of the room, then together in joint team effort, they would restore the level to zero. I also don't make it all the way to the outer seat by the, um, by the stairs uh, next to the seating plane. So on either side, I'm a couple of seats short. And I already predicted that this would be a tight fit. And um, you can see that it's gonna be a tight fit. So why don't we look at a four kilohertz prediction uh, for one of those arrays exclusively. So I'm gonna choose the, the left side I want to see one octave and uh, let's go to four kilohertz and see whether our uh, prediction came true. And you can see that the prediction indeed came true. For reasons that we discussed in previous webinars, we know that we're, uh, we're, we're working with a skill that where each color division represents a uh, three to B step. So that means that if we start on the tip of our flame, which is the halfway point into the room that I lose three decibels at this color and another three decibels and until, until I meet the next transition. And if I go in the other direction, I lose three decibels and another three decibels. And that shows you exactly what um, I've been trying to tell you before, which is that within plus minus 60 B, that is a triangle. And that triangle does not reach all the way to the outer edge of the seating plane. It's a couple of seats short over here and it's a couple of sheets short in the center. So you really see that the 100 degrees is 20 degrees shy of the loudspeaker that um, we would require ideally. Okay, so this is gonna be tight fit. This is gonna be, um, this would be my, my lesser preferred uh, option. Okay, so let's look at both loudspeakers at once. And then we see that um, you know, it, this, this, will, this will barely work in terms of, of coverage. So let's keep that in the back of our mind because we knew as we set out on this journey, we knew that um, the 100 degrees is technically 20 degrees too little. So what changes if we go to the, um, rather than doing two arrays, what if we divide our room in three sectors and make one array a uh, sole custodian over any of those three sectors? What will change is that we will now have three arrays where each array is sole custodian over a uh, part of the audience. Notice that the triangles that I drew in here once more, notice that these triangles are now somewhat overlapping, particularly over here and particularly over there. That was to be expected because we already figured out that the ideal candidate for covering only one third of the room would be a 65 degree loudspeaker and our Lena element would be 35 degrees too wide for that particular job description, which explains the overlap um, where one of the arrays meet. That being said, lesser of two evils is having a little bit more overlap than underlap, uh, which would leave certain areas underexposed. So let's look at a prediction. Let's look at a prediction for these three arrays together. And notice that we now have a very uniform uh, coverage. Um, if we now go from outer wall to outer wall, then we see about three decibels of variance. I can draw a line uh, along this contour and it beautifully shows you that we have about one color division. And that is also true if we go over here, notice how those contours 
gently uh, fade into each other. And uh, we can keep doing this uh, all day long. Everywhere we go, we see three decibels of variance at most. Of course, we have a little bit of overlap, but clearly this is uh, an equally interesting, if not more interesting approach in comparison to the double array approach. So that is, uh, that is the initial analysis in uh, plan view. Uh, and I'm going uh, I'm going to stick with this because now that we go to section view, this is a completely symmetrical fan shaped room. So the section view, the cross section, which is, is the drawing plane that we're about to look at the cross section that runs, uh, that runs, uh, that runs into the screen perpendicular to the screen, that cross section for any of these arrays is expected to be, uh, functionally the same due to the high degree of symmetry that we're dealing with. So any cross section for any of these arrays, regardless whether we use three or only two, will suffice to auto splay the arrays we're about to discover and get a, get a good picture uh, of our possibilities. And in order to do that, I'm going to go to the second instance of map. And in the second instance of map, we see our cross section. And notice that our room has a balcony. So that's going to pose uh, another interesting challenge. So what are we looking at at section view? Um, in section view, we're looking at the edge of the stage, which lives over here. That is also my zero coordinate along the X axis. And notice that along the Y axis, that zero coordinate along the Y axis is the height of the stage deck and not the height of the floor. There's a half meter offset. Yes, the units are meters. Now, one of the first things uh, that we always need to be mindful of is like um, line of sound, or uh, some people refer to it as line of sight. I prefer to, uh, and not just me, this also go for Bob, I prefer to think of it as line of sound, because after all, uh, it's very likely that an array is expected to live somewhere above the edge of the stage. Um, but we also need to be mindful that we have people living underneath the balcony, some of them standing, some of them seat, seated, seated. So if I don't want to have occultation, an acoustic shadow due to the balcony, we need to be mindful of our trim height. We need to be mindful of our trim height to make sure that my waveguides which allow me to send the sound where it needs to go, which is under the balcony, are not obstructed by the balcony face. So that's one of the first things that speaks for itself there we need to be mindful of. So um, I did not intend to raise that. Um, so our array, in all likeliness, our array is probably going to end up somewhere in space over here, over the edge of the stage, uh, where we still have line of sound. Now. I'm sure that you've received the memo, memo, but in today's churches, there's a lot of video. So it's very likely that for such a venue that there might be uh, a video screen uh, in front of the back wall. Um, so these things can become really challenging because with an array that is living such so low, especially with one in the middle, we might get a different problem in return, which is that part of the screen is now occulted by the sound system and no longer visible uh, for the people living in the last row of the balcony. We're not going to work under those assumptions today, but um, more and more will you find video in houses of worship. So our array is, is going to end up somewhere over here in space if we want to preserve line of sound under the balcony, uh, relieving us of the need to deploy under balcony loudspeakers, because that would be a workaround, which we're not going to do today. One of the things that I will always look at when uh, dealing with uh, array systems is, or any system for that matter, is what's the range ratio? If the array ends up in space over there, what is the relationship between where the array will be deployed with respect to the last row and with respect to the start of coverage? Now, we will probably prescribe front fills to pull down the image in the vertical. So I think it's reasonable to say that the array might touch down somewhere come uh, third or fourth row. And the question now becomes, how does this trajectory, how does this trajectory, um, this is the distance 
to uh, v top, how does that trajectory relate to the distance uh, to v bot? This is again uh, things that we've discussed in the auto display webinar, so be sure to watch that. If I had to eyeball this, I would say that that's about four to one, possibly five to one, um, that ratio. If it's four to one, we're looking at a 12 dB channel challenge. If it's, it's five to one, then we're looking at a 14 dB uh, challenge. So why don't we use um, the visual architectural eight and try to get uh, an approximation? So I go to the visual architectural eight. I'm gonna draw a line over here and that tells me that the length of this line segment, the length of this line segment, if I bring up the properties of that line segment, that is about 30 meters. Okay, notice that over here, it says radial distance, 30 meters. Okay, now I'm gonna draw another line segment from that same point in space to the start of coverage. And uh, let's look at the length of that line segment and that like segment is not expected to be 30 meters. It's only nine meters. So today I did a poor job at eyeballing this because nine meters with respect to 30 meters, that is roughly a three to one ratio. So the problem, the challenge that we're trying to overcome is a three to one distance ratio. And three to one expressed in decibels is roughly 10 dB. So we need to uh, angle the array, as we saw in uh, the autosplay webinar, we need to angle the array in such a way that we can decelerate that 10 dB loss and decelerate it preferably to something less than 6 dB, 6 dB or less, which means that we need about four decibels of steering, if you will, which is perfectly possible, perfectly in the realm of possibilities. I have no more application for these two lines, so um, I'm gonna kill those two lines and um, let's bring up the array. I already prepared uh, an array in the start here and there we have the array. Notice that currently it is not angled and that is the first thing that we're gonna do. I wanna make use of the auto splay feature uh, for this. We're gonna use 12 boxes, 12 Lina elements, and I wanna use the auto splay feature, but we have several audience profiles, if you will. And um, in the auto display webinar, we discovered that uh, I can only use uh, one audience plane, one profile, if I will, because we have a profile uh, downstairs, and then we have a profile over here, and we have a profile over here. And uh, how are we going to do that when auto display can only use one profile at a time? Now, in the auto display webinar, we advertised an approach which works very often, um, and that is by simply drawing a line from the start of coverage in one attempt all the way to the end of coverage. That's a very crude attempt and very often it works, um, but today we might want to refine that a little bit. So this is going to be, uh, this is going to be uh, a repetition of, uh, of, of steps. I'm going to select my line segment, right click, I'm going to say edit the architectural visual aid properties, and I'm going to activate this line segment. Let's call this a single slope, single slope audience, I'm gonna activate this as a listener plane. And once I do that, the auto splay algorithm can uh, work with this, uh, can work with this audience plane. Notice that it turned it into a triangle. And that is how you can tell that this line segment has now been activated as a listening plane. Okay, so let's use that to auto splay the array. We've discovered during previous webinars that uh, overshoot is mandatory. So I'm not gonna reiterate why that is mandatory. So I select both array and the listening plane. I go right click, auto display and overshoot adjustment. This is the array that I want to auto display. My listening plane is the single slope audience. I'm gonna overshoot with a single speaker and the smallest angle that I'm willing to use is three degrees. If I now say auto display, then we notice that we get the following solution. What has happened? Um, I've overshot with a single loudspeaker and the smallest angle that I was willing to use was three degrees, which means that this loudspeaker is overshooting my destination by three degrees, which I did intentionally for perfectly good reasons. 
Uh, the bottom speaker, as we discussed in the auto display webinar, is going to the start of coverage, and the heart of your array is going to the heart of your audience. No surprises over here. Let's give this a try, and let's see um, how our energy is distributed over space for this initial attempt. Four kilohertz prediction. Okay, so there we go. And uh, notice that this already looks uh, pretty promising. Pretty promising. Um, so it might be that there's no reason for us to revise this altogether and that the single slope attempt um, worked. So let's investigate by looking at a different frequency. Let me look at two kilohertz. And also at two kilohertz, you know, we are within six decibels and I'm happy as a clam in high tide. Now, how do I come up with the six, deci the six decibels? Um, we see several color transitions starting over here where we go from lime to um, a, a different shade of green. If we were to call that transition zero dB, which we can, that is our prerogative. If we were to call that transition, call that transition zero dB, then each time that we see a color change, we lose three decibels in level. Starting over here, we lose uh, three decibels where we go from, from green to the shade of blue. And then you know, we continue that all the way to the top. And that proves that we stayed within six decibels of variance. And I would be perfectly happy with that. So we have introduced four decibels of steering. And the initial 10 dB loss that we anticipated has been decelerated to a six dB loss. Okay, so it works at two kilohertz, our initial solution. Let's look at uh, four kilohertz. Does it work there as well? I think we already ruled that out. That is four kilohertz, lovely. And let's look at eight kilohertz. Uh, and also at eight kilohertz, I expect this to work really, really well. Okay, so today you see once more that um, using a single slope, even though you have a balcony, using a single slope uh, got the job done in this uh, particular application. Okay, so there you have our cross-section. Um, now, one of the things that I want to do, of course, is um, I also really want to see, so, so how far, where does the edge of coverage live? How far can we come forward? That is to say, how many rows can we approach the stage and make sure that we are uh, still within coverage? A very convenient way of doing that is uh, drawing another line segment starting at the bottom speaker to the point where it intercepts the audience. Okay, now I'm gonna take my pivot tool and I'm gonna pivot around the origin of that line, which started at the bottom of the speaker. Now I have another, oops, I made uh, a selection of multiple objects at once, apologies. I only want to select that line. Now I'm gonna, um, use my pivot tool, I'm gonna to put the pivot point at the bottom loudspeaker and that gives me another dial to look at angles. Uh, and between parentheses, we see the absolute angle and outside the parentheses, we see the relative angle. Now, Lina allows you to set a maximum display of 11 degrees. So that is five and a half degrees in both ways. So what I always check is that if I go five and a half degrees, if you're Lena, if I go five and a half degrees off axis to the bottom loudspeaker, then I get a really good impression where coverage really stops, where the edge of coverage runs. So that is about five and a half, five and a half degrees. And that means that I can now validate that this system should uh, work properly all the way to the second uh, to third row. And then the first two rows will be covered uh, by the front fills, which we will save for another day. So if the front fills are living in the edge of the stage or are mounted on top of the stage, somewhere in this region, the handshake, the transaction between the two, somewhere in this region, this handshake will take place. And the front fills, of course, have a huge advantage that they pull the image towards the subject on stage and they pull it down in the vertical, which is another major advantage because we don't want shower sound. We don't want the sound to come from above. We want the sound to come from the general direction of the audience. Now, why is overshoot mandatory? Why is overshoot mandatory? I'm not gonna explain it in great length. We already did that, but I wanna reiterate it once more. I wanna prove it to you once more, why overshoot is mandatory by doing a prediction only uh, of the 
top three speakers. So I'm gonna select my array. I'm gonna bring up the array properties. And in the array properties, I'm gonna solo the top three speakers, number one, two, and three. And that is a perfectly a symmetrical module, if you will, because these top three elements that I'm highlighting at this point all have the same inter-element splay angle. So there's three degrees between enclosure number one and two, and there's three degrees between enclosure number two and three. So that's a completely symmetrical module, a chunk of the larger Lena array. I'm gonna solo those loudspeakers. I'm gonna turn on the master solo, and now we can do a prediction of only those two loudspeakers, and it will prove once more why overshoot is necessary. Because notice, again, that on access to the top loudspeaker, it is not as loud when you live at the same distance. It's not as loud as on access to the second to last speaker. This is what I call the tip of the flame. The tip of the flame is touching down exactly where I want it to touch down, which is at the last row of the balcony, whereas the second to last loudspeaker shows the same level as the top loudspeaker, but it's in between where you're in the joint custody of all three speakers, where you get the bulk of your energy for those three loudspeakers, proving you once more that overshoot is mandatory. So there we have our cross section. Okay, I'm happy with this for now, but what else is there to do? Well, we might need to be mindful of, you know, what does that loudspeaker, how does that loudspeaker behave? And I'm referring to the bottom loudspeaker, how does it behave by the time it touches down at the fourth row? Because in down tilt translation, we explain the limitations of working in two dimensional space when living in the three dimensional world. But there's a perfectly good remedy to fix that and we call that down tilt translation, which requires us to tilt that bottom speaker, tilt that bottom speaker so that its propagation plane its propagation plane, which is currently indicated by the diagonal arrow, that is the direction where the sound propagates, we need to pivot that loudspeaker until its propagation plane runs level to the drawing plane, in plan view, mind you. And this is the drawing plane in plan view, so we're gonna use a very neat trick, which is a very straightforward trick. I'm going to clear all my annotations and I'm going to bring in a single I'm going to bring in a single individual loudspeaker and it's going to be a Lena element from the drop down menu. So where does it show up? There shows the Lena. This is the wrong orientation. This is plan view. I want to see it in section view. So I'm going to select that loudspeaker and I'm going to instruct in its property. I don't want to see that loudspeaker from above. I want to see that loudspeaker from the side. And that fixes that issue. I'm going to use this loudspeaker as a proxy for the bottom loudspeaker in my array. And I'm going to give it the same orientation. So that is a proxy for the bottom loudspeaker in the array pointing at the fourth row. Now I'm going to keep that loudspeaker and use my same pivot point tool, my same pivot tool, but this time I'm going to put the pivot point where the loudspeaker intersects the fourth row. And that allows me to orbit, to orbit that fourth row. And I'm going to orbit that fourth row with that bottom speaker of the array in such a way until its propagation uh, plane, indicated by the dash line, runs level, level to the drawing plane. So this is now the propagation plane of that speaker. And that now runs level to the drawing plane. These lines are running parallel to each other. And that new position, as we explained in down tilt translation, that new position is what we call the translated position. This is the translated position uh, from its original position where it lived over there. So those that watched the down tilt translation webinar now know what this allows me to do. It allows me to go back to plan view and start, start with, uh, start with, let's start off with our stereo version first, or I should say our two banana, our two array version. This was our initial attempt. And now that we have the translated position as well, which we can tell from section view lives 
four meters to the back of the edge of the stage, four meters to the back of the edge of the stage, now that we have the translated position, we can bring up those translated positions. These orange loudspeaker icons, these are now your translated positions living four meters to the back from the edge of the stage. Doing it this way, even though working in two-dimensional space, allows me now to assess, allows me to assess what is the coverage, what is the width of coverage by the time that we touch down with that bottom speaker in the fourth row. So this is the, this is the width come fourth row. Notice that over here, we're touching down in the fourth row. This is the width of that bottom loudspeaker in the fourth row on the other side of the house. And again, what we already knew for the steer approach is that we are underexposed over here and we are underexposed over here and we are underexposed over here. The first two rows will be covered um, by the future front fills. So I got some very, uh, I got some holes in what are most likely money seats. Um, nothing, no insurmountable problem. This is where you have your fill speakers as infill, center fills and outfills. But uh, these areas, would require uh, tender love and care, especially if we have subwoofers living uh, somewhere near the corners of the stage, because then the only thing that will not be missing over there are fresh and intelligible mid and high frequencies. Uh, uh, sorry, there's a polarity reversal in my reasoning. The only thing that will not be missing over there is low frequencies. It's everything else that's missing over there, which is fresh and intelligible mid and high frequencies. So here you see a prime example of using down tilt translation to assess, do I have enough coverage with respect to that bottom speaker in my array once I touch down in the first row using down tilt translation. So again, we see that the stereo approach does not give us the optimum coverage. It's a tight fit, but we already knew this when we started this journey. Now, by comparison, if I bring up the triple array approach, then this would be uh, our design, and these would be the translated positions. And of course, since each cross-section is uh, the same, those translated positions would, in all instances, expect to be also four meters pushed backward, okay? Um, pushed backward. Now, we already knew that for the, uh, for, the, for the major coverage, the macro shape, we already knew that we had a little bit of overlap. This was already known, but we said, you know, if you have to choose between a little bit of overlap versus a little bit of underlap, then overlap is, uh, is preferred. So in, in the macro shape, we're already in a good place. But now I want to take out the, 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 the macro shape, the coverage of the big room, and I want to look only at those triangles for, uh, for the bottom loudspeakers in our array and see whether we're also in a, in a good shape over there. So I'm gonna kill the layer that has my uh, three main PAs. I wanna only see the down tilt translated loudspeakers and notice that um, also they, that is to say the bottom speaker in each array, they are also overlapping in those very expensive uh, money seats rather than leaving us with those minor gaps that we had before. Also over here, that bottom speaker always all the way reaches to the aisle, to the stars running next to the audience plane. So again, um, with a loudspeaker that is a little bit too wide, we prevented any uh, gaps in the coverage. So it not only works in the distant part of the room, it also works on access to that bottom speaker. Um, we already saw a prediction um, in the far field, that is to say in the distant part of the room, let's look at the translated prediction. And then we will see that those uh, that the fourth row is completely covered, come fourth row is completely covered, again, within 3 dB of variance uh, with respect to those bottom speakers. So there you see a prime example of how down tilt translation is a very convenient solution. Okay, so uh, if I had to choose the lesser of two evils and Lena was the preferred choice, then uh, this is how I would go about it. And that would give us, um, that would give us a solid level. Let's introduce a microphone and uh, let's put the microphone somewhere in the second uh, two thirds of the room, maybe somewhere over here in this particular venue. Uh, it's not uncommon in a house of worship that the, the front of house position <clears throat> might be on the balcony. And let's see if we can get a headroom plot at uh, that point in space. 
So this shows us a band spectrum. This shows us the headroom. And uh, let's look at the small print. Using Lina, 12 elements. We're looking at uh, values in order of uh, 90 dBA uh, with a peak value for ping noise in order of 106 uh, dBZ. If you need more, well, then you have to step up from Lina to Leopard and ultimately to Lion. And if you have a big, big, big venue, you might even want to need um, Leo. But this uh, gives you values in the, in the 90s uh, range uh, at the front of house um, position. But you can always scale it up to meet your demands. And then finally, just as an appetizer, just uh, to whet your appetite, there is one more thing that I would like to show you. Um, one more thing that I would like to show you uh, just to whet your appetite and uh, hopefully it will, you know, you will come back to, to see the, um, to see the follow-up and that is LMBC. <clears throat> I'm not going to explain LMBC here. I just want to show you uh, what it does and make you appreciate, uh, make you appreciate um, what it could do for you. So I'm going to clear my drawings. Um, and uh, let's bring up the array that I uh, the array that I previously because that is already wired and patched uh, the way I intended to. Um, so let's let's take this guy. That is the array that I had in mind. Okay, it's functionally the same array. That's already patched. Um, so at four kilohertz, I would expect a little or no difference. It is muted for whatever reason. Um, so let me briefly look into that. Uh, layer management, let's unlock this layer. Let's go to that array and see what could be going on. Um, okay. There's no reason why this shouldn't work. So here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna do rinse and repeat and make sure that we are in a good place, okay. Nine out of 10 times, this is me making an operator error. So don't worry. Let's try this again. There is the array. Let's do a four kilohertz picture. Okay, we already confirmed that. And, uh, but now I wanna show you uh, something very uh, uh, particular. Let's go to 250 Hertz. And notice that at 250 Hertz, this beam is very defined, very defined. And uh, if I bring up my drawing tool, you can see that this beam is pointing under the balcony and it's perpendicular. It's perpendicular to the array as a whole. So there is the array and notice that it's roughly at a 90 degree angle to the overall orientation of the array. It also means that if you were to abandon this point in the room, let's say first row underneath the balcony and walk to from the edge of the stage that the level drops. And the same is true when you would go up the balcony, then the level drops. Now that is counterintuitive, not going up the balcony for the level to drop, but approaching the stage for the level to drop. Because if anything, then our expectation is that when we approach the stage, things are expected to get louder and not softer. So in a future webinar, we're gonna explain how um, LBC, low mid beam control, can improve this situation. I'm just gonna activate it and you will not understand how it works, but we'll cover that during a different webinar. I've just enabled the low mid beam control and let's see how that beam looks with the low mid beam control enabled. And suddenly we will see that this beam is now much wider, unlike before, okay? At this point, it might appear to be magic to you, but rest assured in the foreseeable future, we're gonna talk at great length about LMBC and uh, hopefully you will come back. So. This is with LMBC, that same octave at 250 hertz. Now I'm going to turn it off once more by putting it into bypass. And then let's look at it without LMBC. And then you see that concentration, that focus of energy again underneath the balcony, which, uh, which is ill-advised. So in order to figure out uh, LMBC, to learn about LMBC, be sure to join us uh, for the LMBC webinar in the foreseeable future. Okay. so. There you have uh, a case study using Lina, investigating, should we use two? Should we use three? Uh, can we use the autosplay? Yes, we can. Is overshoot mandatory? Sure, as always, it's mandatory. 
Should we use two arrays or three arrays? All the decision-making processes. And um, I hope you enjoyed that. That means that I'm going to uh, go back to the keynote and um, go to some uh, closing remarks. As always, this webinar will be available on YouTube. Uh, and another thing that I want to bring to your attention is that uh, this Friday, we will have our third instance of the on-demand a la carte session. And the options that you can choose from are Montreux Jazz, M-Noise, and Frontfill systems. In order to make your preference known, please go to the MeyerSound Facebook user group uh, where there's a poll in the announcements at the top of the page where you can make your preference uh, known. And then, depending on your vote, we're going to talk about any of these three topics uh, this Friday. So uh, that brings us to the end of today's presentation. This webinar will be uploaded to Thinking Sound, the Myersound YouTube channel. You already saw the link at the beginning of uh, today's webinars, which means that uh, I'm perfectly happy to take another five minutes and answer some of your questions, uh, should you have them. Please use the chat uh, to, pose, um, to pose any questions. Okay, John Sharp rose his hand. Go for John. Is LMBC only available with uh, Leo family? Um, yes, only Leo family products. That is Lena, Leopard, Lion, and Leo. Okay. Any other questions that I can answer at this point? Okay, I wish M-Noise will be covered as well. Um, I really hope that we get to cover M-Noise as well, and I think we can make that happen. Um, thank you. Tonal balance without LNBC. Tonal balance without LNBC would mean that I, it's what I call the meaty part. Um, you, you saw in what direction, you saw in what direction that, um, that beam is pointing, and that goes, you know, towards the middle of your audience, perpendicular to your ray, which means that if you are... In that position, it sounds firm because you have the meaty part, you have the low mids, the 250 and so. And if you go to the approach, you know, if you approach the stage, you lose this. You get top end because there's less air between you and the array. So you get top end and typically you get low end, but your frequency response in the middle starts to sag. So rather than sounding firm, it sounds a little bit feeble. And... Um, and that is uh, typically undesired, and uh, LNBC is something that can fix that because this is beyond the this is beyond the resolve of EQ. The root cause that you're dealing with is that you have a time problem, and a time problem requires a time band aid, and not a level band aid. So total balance is improved using LNBC. Yes, very much. Any other questions at this point? Okay, well, um, that means that I think that uh, we're good for today. So uh, as always, please stay safe, please stay healthy, best to you and your loved ones, and hopefully see you on Friday. Bye-bye.